on to the producer. The disarm as well from the cover man's harbor. It's from FY! Oh, 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 FY! FY! Flipping Y! He absolutely smashes the only them. miracle and Kura left alive for the Raptors in! The Yap Hole! He's got the control! Miracle, the last one left alive! Mantis Pop, he's now been silenced! The lucky shot's there! Miracle's dead! They'll take the top rank, they'll she. take the game, they'll take the series! Hello, welcome to a very special Esports in 30. I'm Marissa, this right here is Nick, and we are so thrilled to have you today. Brody is away, so while he's away, Nicholas will play. He's got Dota, baby. Dota 2 action. Nick, it's been a while since you and I have discussed Dota. I think it's been about a month-ish. Probably closer to two. Okay, fine. I know he's counting the days, really, and he has been counting the days since we got to talk Dota again. So why don't you give us a quick update on what's been happening and where we're at right now? Yeah, so we're heading towards TI, uh, where this was the, the MDL Disneyland Major was what mm. we got. Disney, Dota is a magical game, only fitting that we have a, a magical place to host our... our Fourth major out of five. Um, every point is super important right now, yeah. and so we saw some awesome teams, some awesome plays in an awesome place. With and Aww. it was really weird seeing like Mickey come out and like hand out the trophy. It was really weird. No, but you loved it as a Dota fan. It, I'm it was assuming... both really awesome and really weird. Yeah, yeah. I feel like you're a low key Disney fan also. Uh, you, you, you've got you've got some secrets. That the House of Mouse maybe I don't uh, know. Okay, all right. It's in there. He's got it. That sounds like an awesome tournament. Of course, we had to talk about it now. We all know Dota 2 is insanely complicated, which is why on the other side of these highlights, we'll be lucky enough to be talking to an expert. He goes by Tsunami, and he'll be with us right after you watch this. They're collapsing onto on Artizi. The Doom was laid down on Tanisha, but he still has that reincarnate. He's gonna have that second life. Midpoint jumps in. Jackals are there as well. Samel's trapped. He's dead and gone. Secret that looks towards Crit. Controls there from Midpoint with the root. Crit's dead as well. Triple kill. For the Meepo. There's the buyback for Samel, but he's surely gonna die yet again. He has a running in the trees. But Nisha, he's chasing, he's hunting. Midpoint, eyes on to fly. He's moving in on the Oracle. The E blades out upon him. Lies trying his best to run. Shackles down to Samel. It's to die back, it's a rampage! Over. Maybe they can still go for the fight. They're gonna blow up. Nice, Nine stun. Hard stun out for Monkeys Forever. Look at the side blades go! They're going for Brax immediately, trying to take him down. They will be successful. Ice Mike is dead, and now Eternal Envy has no supporting cast, so he's slowly gonna be run down. Triple kill for Lim. The disarm as well, from to the Maz Harbor. They go back! Oh, 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 F1! Flipping one! He absolutely smashes them! Locking down Miracle. They're isolating him, but Old 11. He has the Aegis at least. Old Chicken. He just right playing. He's like, please, we gotta get this kill. The Doom will come back oh, alive. It's so close. Will, will he go down the Solar Crest on him? He's still just right clicking through it. Holy smokes. He gets all of his mana back. Triple happily died, but he got RTZ out safe. He's gonna take a long time to get bought down. In fact, Samel, S4. Oh, the, coil. The, the coil. He's onto the four of them. The silence as well. RTZ on the front lines. He's ripping them apart. Three dead on OG. Anna, they're trying to fight back, but RTZ is a triple. It's an ultra. They just want to burst somebody down that AM. It's not gonna drop bottom lane. Look at the jump in from Zai with the illusions out from the animage. They'll make short work of Chalice, who's had a rough go of it. And oh. now X Nova's dead as well. Zai cancels TP, realizing that support could not handle the illusions. Maybe he's gonna try and go for Zai here, but he's seen Zai with the illusions no. as well. Oh my on. god. LGD. He will be sure to answer this. They come forward. Mantis from Ramses removing the silence. Stun. stun out to two of them. Ramses is on top of Anna. Anna trying his best to retreat. Seb with the Ghost Rider looking to slow them down, block them off. Deafening Blast connects onto the Drow Ranger. Can they finally kill him? Jack Echo. in. Echo onto two. Shuts down both the Nature's Prophet and the and the Sand King. Sand King will survive as he's able to get away. Anna still, still alive. Lives. Turns around. They take down a third. Double kill for Anna. CE is also chasing an extra one here. GH. But Tom Man somehow still staying alive because of all that magic life. Steel. He's alive still. He can't actually run away, but he's he one on four in fight. Now he is going to come back in, and with his extra damage, that should be enough. Last, the Echo Slam comes down and lays out, and Centaur's actually dead. Oh my he, God, he's he, going to live! As well, he's going to live. He's, he's still, still alive. alive. Still alive. They're going to run into me. Zip, though, who did have the vision? He's able to get the get the Invisible Blade after the jump. The Axe Fall. A nightmare might just save him until no, the first damage comes in. What an insane interaction. The BKB pop by Whole Chicken. Will it be enough though? So it looks like it will. He's in a lot of trouble. He's doomed up as well. Dark. Then he's going to try to pull. The oh, kick. the kick over. Will it? 
survive it. Looks like he's muted for about five more spins. GH going, there's the PA death. What a play. Only Miracle and Kerr left alive, but he's oh, yeah, got The app hole. He's got the control. Miracle, the last one left alive. Mantis Bob, he's now been silenced. The lucky shot's there. Miracle's dead. They'll take the top rank. They'll take the game. They'll take the series. There was plenty of Dota magic in the air in Disneyland, but at the end of the day, uh, it was all Seeker who earned their happy ending. Joining us now to chat all about the MDL Disneyland Major. Welcome, Tsunami. How are you? It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. We are so happy to have him. Super happy to have you. Yeah. Let's get started with Secret because these guys are on a tear right now. Mm -hmm. Three out of four major grand finals, two wins. Um, and for me, every time we go into a, one of these majors, I feel like Secret is, maybe it's like, this is the time that they're not going to be so consistent, they're not going to make grand finals. Maybe mm. somebody has their number and it never seems to happen. So Tsunami, from your perspective, what's the secret to Secret's consistency? I think you know I hit the nail on the head. It's just every single time people are waiting for them to not hit their standard, but that's not gonna happen. Puppy is a grandmaster captain. He knows what he's doing and it's just more teams are just having to catch up and maybe they catch up on like a patch by patch basis, but Secret just figures it out too quickly. I think last year Virtus Pro did a really good job at proving dominance, but it was their consistency that was lacking, especially whenever they would show up at TI. But Secret, on the other hand, they don't seem to be struggling with consistency at all. You know, maybe they would not get like grand finals at like the DreamHack Major, uh, Dream League Major most recently. But mm. beyond that, I mean, they're consistently raking in the DPC points. They're just too strong. You mentioned Puppy briefly, but we do want to talk to him, talk about him a little bit more because he was named the finals MVP as he led his team to another title. So talk to us about your experiences interacting with this player and what makes him such a special leader in this game. I think longevity is the first thing that comes to people's mind whenever they talk about Puppy. The dude has been in the game since Dota 1 and been at the top of the game easily on my personal Mount Rushmore for Dota 2 of most you know dominant players of all time. And I think a lot of it comes down to the fact that he is willing to step out of his comfort zone, or maybe it is his comfort zone, to take players who are just not as well known. Last year it was Ace uh, recruiting onto Secret to be the new carry player. This year it was Nisha. And he's proven time and time again all he really needs is just to see potential. If he sees potential, he's more than willing to put in the effort, bring these players up to like a top tier capability. And it's that sort of consistency that I think a lot of other captains don't have or maybe the willingness to you know take these underutilized uh, regional specialties in European carries and bring them up to you know such a competitive level. So kind of the foil to Puppy is, is obviously his former uh, teammate and friend, Kuroki here, mm -hmm. a good friend of his. Um, his Liquid team heading into this major really needed to make something happen. They were didn't have that many points. Their DPC season was not that great, mm -hmm. and they made second place. Uh, Miracle had an unbelievable tournament. He was fantastic. So how did Liquid bounce back at this tournament, uh, considering their pretty lackluster start to this, the DPC season? Mm -hmm. I was surprised as well, especially at the most recent major, they lost like first round of lower bracket to a South American team that a lot of people did not expect very much of. And a lot of people were suspecting that maybe maybe roster changes were going to happen soon for Liquid. But they, I think, maybe just got like a stronger handle on the patch. And they also had a very, very long journey to the grand finals. They got sent to lower bracket very early on. They had to play like eight series, eight best of threes to finally make it to the grand finals. And you could see that overall the drafts were getting better, the plays were getting better. And it didn't become so much of like a just GH single-handedly carrying the team or just Miracle single-handedly carrying the team. It was becoming more and more cohesive. And that's what brought Liquid so much success in their TI victory and something that I I think has been lacking throughout the earlier part of the season. Let's talk about Miracle a little bit more because he had a fantastic tournament, especially down the stretch. How important in Dota is it for your stars to just show up and how can a team set a player like Miracle up for success when he's already playing so well? I think that's one of the critiques that a lot of people have about evil geniuses right now mm -hmm. is despite them doing well, you know, consistently getting top three, consistently third place every single time, I, more often than not, they're not letting Sumail, who is their real showstopper, to you know go off on heroes that he's known for. And more often than not, I think Liquid is willing to do that with Miracle. Mm. And I think a lot of it comes down to an understanding of saving Miracle's heroes to towards the end of the draft to make sure he doesn't get countered out, give him his specialties, his juggernauts, 
and stuff like that. And overall, um, the flexibility of letting Matu take sort of a lower priority, which I think a lot of people have uh, yearned to see Matu be more of a, I guess, playmaker, but Liquid finds their success whenever it's on Miracle, and Matu plays his role perfectly. All he needs to do is just help create space for Miracle, and a lot of teams are understanding that, yeah, it's more often than not that if uh, one player is getting sacrificed and maybe you can take advantage of it, it's kind of the same thing with Secret. Uh, more often than not, Nisha and Mid One have a very similar relationship where Mid One will take a ba back seat and Nisha will just, you know, farm, farm, farm until he's ready to carry them to late game. I think that's part of the reason why that made that grand final so interesting is because those two teams had such a similar dynamic with their mid role and their carry role. Uh, speaking of teams that tend to sacrifice a player, Ninjas in Pajamas, uh, with Fada obviously being the player that t tends to get a little bit uh, the, the short stick here, they came into the situ uh, this major kind of in a similar situation as Liquid, where it felt like they needed to have a pretty strong performance. They won the minor, they made top six here. Now that they're officially a lock for TI, walk us through kind of the development of this NIP roster mm -hmm. as they've been under PPD for the last couple months. I had a lot of skepticism. After PPD left Optic last year, I thought that Zai was probably his most important ingredient in that roster, but he ended up taking 33 with him. And initially I was not really seeing, I mean, 33 is a fantastic player. And I think he was probably one of their best players during that Optic roster. But at the beginning of the season, it just wasn't really showing. And then they were still showing up to majors, which is important because in the European region, the most heavily contested region right now in the DPC, they were still making it through the qualifiers. Then finally, in this most recent one, they didn't. They had to slug it through the minors, made it through all the way. And I think that same thing with Liquid. Uh, Liquid had to play a ton of games in that most recent major here. NIP had to play a ton of games in their minor run, ended up coming out on top. And I think it's that experience while I'm sure it was grueling for the players. I think it was very, very important that they got that experience because otherwise I wasn't really that confident in them, but they made it to TI now. They've, they've locked in with their DPC rankings. And I think a part of that is again, more often than not teams being willing to struggle through the adversity as opposed to just kick a player and be like, you know, let's just change something up and maybe that'll fix it. Right. And, and I mean, sometimes momentum in esports can be such a big thing and momentum yeah. in different esports uh, also has different values. Yeah. How much of do you think momentum has in Dota where, you know, for example, your Vici Gaming came through the minor last time as well and then they won that major. So was it a similar situation for, for NIP? Mm. I kept vocalizing the prophecy, you know, if Vici Gaming were able to go from minor to major victories, maybe NIP could replicate it. Uh, and they, they got further than I was expecting, being able to make it through at least like the first round of the upper bracket and have a reasonably strong group stage despite being in one of the more difficult groups. I was encouraged by that. It's just that momentum is kind of uh, it's balanced out by the fact that, you know, to have momentum, you have to play a lot of games. And to play a lot of games, you have to do a lot of drafts. Mm. And so if you have a really strong captain who has a wide variety of strategies, your team has a wide variety of heroes, then you can get away with that kind of momentum. And I think that's what brought Vici Gaming so much success and their minor to major victory. Right. But with NIP, I think it was a little bit, little bit more narrow. Mm. Um. I want to talk a little bit with about OG here because they're slowly coming back into the picture, yeah. right? Uh, with Anna back into the picture. So uh, top six actually puts them in a good place for TI. So what do you see as OG's trajectory for the last major? And maybe will our defending champs be able to lock in that TI spot and make a run at defending their title? OG is an inscrutable team. I never really know what to make of them. I didn't know what to make of them last year. They assembled their roster basically a month before TI, and then they won the whole damn thing with it. And so obviously they were having a lot of difficulty at the beginning of this season, not having Ana, going through PyCat, ILTW, and basically just keeping Ana's seat warm until he finally returned into the fold. But it seemed like old times. Uh, I, after their qualifier, I spoke to Seb and he was, I, I was like, is there, was there any growing pain? You know, Ana had been off the team for like six months or something like that. Is there like a acclimation period or something like that? And he was like, no, it immediately just felt very, very comfortable. And they ended up coming into the major. I didn't have the highest expectations and they beat Virtus Pro. And Virtus Pro has consistently been one of the best teams. And more often than not, I'll see these 
uh, I, I'm not gonna say fluke because fluke is more often than not like being used as a kind of a negative connotation, but these unpredictable victories, these unpredictable rosters showing up and OG showing up during this major with just bringing in Ana randomly. I didn't think they would be able to show that much comfortability, but they beat VP. They did not do very well against Liquid, but Liquid made it to the grand finals. So I think going into TI, I would be very, very surprised if, Liqu uh, if OG didn't make it back into the DPC ranking to qualify for TI directly. Mm. Once we get to TI, we'll have to see how the patch favors them. Yeah, you mentioned uh, the OG VP match, and you said that uh, OG beat them, but it was actually kind of, they kind of crushed oh, them. They it was handled like them. Two, like two games less than 25 minutes, I believe, and then they went down to the lower bracket of VP, and then they lost to PSG LGD. So certainly not a team that you're ashamed about losing to, mm -hmm. but it didn't feel like this was kind of your standard VP performance that you expect from them at a major. So where, what's your kind of, your read on where VP's pulse is at right now and like heading into the next major? Because they certainly don't need the points, mm -hmm. but it sure would be nice for them to get a win for momentum's sake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I keep saying that maybe VP have like senioritis and, you know, like, oh, we've already qualified, whatever. You know, we don't really play that, that we, you know, saving strats and all that. I just say that for entertainment value. I do think that VP are, you know, champions at heart. They're going to try to play every single game as well as they can. But at the same time, like, they, they didn't do that well at this major. And then ESL Birmingham, which is coming up, they dropped out of it to participate in another LAN with probably not as high quality opponents, but maybe it would be an easier tournament to win. You get, you know, an easy prize pool. You have to travel less, stuff like that. And so part of it may be fatigue. Part of it may just be that the, they're waiting until the next balance patch comes out. But VP, every single time that people consider them to be favorites coming into a TI, they don't win. So maybe this is their new plan, is to be like, <laughs> well, we're going to go under the radar a little bit, we're going to take that target off of our back, and then maybe whenever it comes to TI, then we'll really put it on. Yeah. I love that plan. Yeah, maybe sandbag right up until TI, so that the pressure's a little bit less on us. <laughs> Works every time. It worked Wait, for OG exactly. last year. There that, you that, go. They had inverse pressure. They had they had absolutely no pressure at all. Yeah. <laughs> I want to talk about EG here, because they finished top three. Again, third place finish for this DPC. Uh, what do you see as holding this team back from really reaching their full potential? Like, what ingredient really is missing here to put Evil Geniuses over the top? I had alluded to it earlier. Every single time that I see EG play, I feel like they're not letting Sumail be as big of a playmaker as he has the potential for. Everyone knows what he's capable of. Ever since he first emerged on the scene, he's been on this team ever since he was in this competitive uh, scene entirely. And I, I do think that it's cool to see that Arteezy is getting more and more stuff to do, because back in the days when Sumail would single-handedly carry games, then Arteezy would be relegated to like a way lower role, or Universe back in the day would be relegated to like a way lower role. Now it seems like Arteezy and Sumail are more hand-in-hand, -hand, but at the same time, I I mean, there's, there's nothing to be ashamed of with third place. Being able to make it Absolutely this not. high every single time <laughs> is a feat in itself. But again, these players are champions, they want a victory. I'm sure Arteezy definitely wants to finally win of a Valve event as a champion once and for all. And I think part of it may be hopefully Bulba finally, you know, eases up on forcing Sumail to play like these Razors and the Vipers, these, you know, lane winners, but not necessarily game winners and mm -hmm. give them something a little bit more interesting to do. Now, we spent a lot of time talking about the European teams. We kind of mm. touched on NA with uh, EG here. I want to touch, go to China, actually, because it right now kind of feels to me like there's really two main hopes, and they're both locked in for TI, that being PSG LGD and Vici Gaming. They both played pretty well, but didn't really make it further than, like, top six. Mm. So what sets kind of those two teams apart from the rest of the Chinese pack in your eyes? Making it to the major is the most important thing. Intra-regionally, China is very, very difficult to read. They mm -hmm. play so much in uh, within like their in houses, and they have like, you know, these random leagues that are just online tournaments. And in other regions, you don't really see that. Other regions, you'll have like online tournaments for like CIS or South America because they're trying to foster tier two talent. But you won't really see tier one teams play in those sorts of things. Yeah. Whereas in China, you see that a little bit more frequently. And they also have a more uh, a stronger emphasis on like academy teams or youth teams where they will you know, try to see potential in like pub stars and then harness that by putting them in a competitive environment and see where they go. Mm -hmm. This year, it hasn't really panned out for them. Like you said, it's really only uh, PSG LGD and Vici Gaming that have really broken through, but the rest of the Chinese teams are like bouncing around like RNG or E-Home. They have a lot of notable names, 
but they're not really going anywhere. And then even the other teams that have notable names, like Newbie with SCCC, like where has he been? And uh, like now we have all these new qualifier teams showing up like Sirius or something like that. Aster was another one. and. All these, you'd think that like if they made it, then you'd be like, oh, obviously, you know, they have such and such player. It makes so much sense that they're finally at this event, but it's not happening. And it, it's kind of troubling to me because next TI is in China. And I really hope that a Chinese team is in grand finals. Otherwise, it's going to be pin drop silence over there. Yeah, the, the, A, the cycle needs to be reestablished. And B, it's weird to not have like one of the handsomest men in Dota SCCC at all these tournaments, That's right? That's what I'm saying, yeah. Mm. Okay, so Tsunami, what you're saying is that you don't see any other team at this point in time than the ones you named as coming up or being a legitimate threat. Not yet, and it would probably take a f uh, between this minor major cycle. I don't really see anything impressive happening. It's going to have to happen at TI itself if China wants to break through. Because right now, they are relying on the front runners of LGD and Vichy Gaming to kind of carry the torch of the region. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, they're coming back to the region and bringing the lessons that they learn and participating in these in-house tournaments and you know showing the region as a whole like we can power up. Because right now, even based off of who qualified for the major, nothing special is really happening. And that, you know, gives me pause. Yeah. Let's keep region hopping, if you don't mind. Let's touch on Southeast Asia, because they had a not very good uh, major in Paris. Mineski made it the farther, which doesn't necessarily feel like a good sign when your fanatics are, of the world are, are kind of going out early. So from your perspective, what happened with Fnatic and kind of SIA generally this, this tournament and kind of the future of the region as we look towards these intensely competitive kind of like last couple spots for TI. Fnatic is troubling for me right now. Ice 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 is my boy, so I, any team that he goes on, I, I, I will Ice always Ice, man. I'm with you yeah. too. Ride or die, but right now he's dying, and it's not good right now because he, he, at the major, like, okay, whatever. Maybe it's a bad tournament, something like that. They had a bad group stage. They also had a bad lower bracket. Maybe it's excusable, but then even in the qualifier for this major, they got taken to game five by a stack. It was Winter's stack, and so, you know, Winter's a for formerly accomplished player, not necessarily recently accomplished, and yet he was still able to take Fnatic to a game five after having like an 11 hour qualifier run or something like that. And for a team that should be a lock for TI, I don't really think they should be taken to the limit like that, even intra-regionally, whenever, you know, like I said, for China, it's kind of difficult to read. Same thing with Southeast Asia, it's often difficult to read. But still, like, your your top tier teams should still look top tier, and Fnatic hasn't really looked top tier. And so, at the most, I'm hoping maybe the next patch, like, you know, like Timbersaw is not very good right now, it's one of Ice Ice's favorite heroes. Yeah. Uh, it's possible that that may be contributing to it, but hopefully they step it up soon because I I think it's it's missed potential right now from Southeast Asia. It, it would be such a shame to not see Abed, the the boy wonder, have such have an amazing performance at TI again, right? So, dude, I would every single time he's at a TI, I just pick him for easy fantasy points every time because <laughs> he will always show up and it's easy, <laughs> easy. You. I love that. It's so clutch. Uh, I want to talk about the future of NA, though, because there really seems to be like one team in it for too long. Like we have Beast Coast and Complexity didn't really do anything. So uh, how large is the gap between EG and the rest of North America? And what can teams like, I mean, Complexity and BC do to catch up? I think that being uh, one one slot being taken away from North America is a good step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. As as controversial as that is for me to say as a North American, I think that was the kind of tough love that the region needed. Now two of the minor victors will be going on to the major as opposed to one. Uh, this is like something that very recently was implemented by Valve and it was in the middle of the season, which was kind of unconventional, but I think it's because they don't really know what to do with these extra slots. And so why not just make it in a LAN environment. Like once upon a time, we used to have like wild cards for TI, where a bunch of teams would be able to complete from different regions, and then that would determine who would be able to go on to like the main bracket of TI. And so I like the concept of being able to, you know, congregate all these players in a minor environment, and then see who's the best there. North America specifically, like you mentioned, Beast Coast complexity, not necessarily high expectations for them, and they, uh, much to the satisfaction of the people who were hoping they would fail, did not do well. Beast Coast, obviously, very, very controversial due to their roster changes, and be specifically like kicking Gunner for like the second time on another team, and so a lot of people were rooting for them to fail, and that's never a good feeling whenever you come into a tournament. And so them kind of delivering on that was, uh, I'm sure, very, very heartbreaking for them. And then even going into these upcoming 
swimming tournaments like it's it, it's not going to happen because they're just not qualifying for these things as easily as they should be so i think being able to uh to tighten the belt on the number of slots available hopefully that makes them feel a little bit more competitive and hopefully eg is coming back to the region and like practicing with them because you know with three european players obviously they may not be tempted to play within their region despite valve's specific instructions that you really better but eg is a known organization i'm sure they're playing by the rules but hopefully they're scrimming by the rules also and you know scrimming with their regional partners otherwise the gap is just going to widen and north america is just going to look bad mm -hmm. as we move forward uh, speaking of a team that was kind of right on the edge of those regional rules, and we're going to touch on our last region here, um, South America and Chaos. So obviously the big news for Chaos was they were probably one of the best teams in South America, or kind of that, that Latin America region, and they've decided to remove their roster. We're taking a break, Misery's going back to Europe, and they're leaving the region entirely. So what do you kind of see as the future of South America in this maybe like power void mm -hmm. that's now happened? Oh, and Tavo, of course, went to um, North America as well. Mm -hmm. Right. So what do you see is kind of like happening in this region with the power void that happens when Chaos leaves? I think the most disappointing thing about Chaos Leaving is that, yet again, more of the leadership that is lacking heavily in South America kind of goes away. Not only because an organization that's very reputable is leaving, but because, like, misery, like, these established players who have played on tons and tons of different teams and made it to very, very high levels, he's leaving. And as a result, you're kind of left again with your South American compatriots and you're looking for leadership within that region. And I don't think that's going to happen. We see these uh, South American teams that will, you know, look good for like one tournament and then, you know, due to relationship issues or the lack of leadership, then they'll just disband and the players will go the separate ways. Like Tavo is going to North America, which I don't blame him for. He's a very, very skilled player. And I think that he will probably find more success going under a team like Complexity that will foster his talent as opposed to just kind of like squeeze him for whatever he has and just like make it to a major and be like, all right, cool. We got some money. Let's just yeah. peace out now. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, one final question. And you better be truthful, Tsunami. <laughs> How much money have you spent on the TI Compendium so far this year? All right, so on the day that it was released, we were all at Disneyland, and like all of our laptops were patching at the same time. And so at, during the tournament, my laptop didn't make the cut. And so I just <laughs> had to watch in the distance as everyone else was pouring in the money, and I, I would see a little tear roll down my <laughs> cheek. But now I've gotten back home, and I... Uh, Let's just say that the, the chat wheel siren song is very, very strong. And me being able to sell all the Crimson Witness treasures that I got at TI on the Steam market, and then, you know, it's it's a feedback loop. You know, Dota gives me money, and then I put it back in. That's right. Let's just say it's it's past three digits pretty comfortably. Oh! The, the Gaben giveth, and the Gaben taketh away. <laughs> exactly. Zunami, thank you so much. It's been fantastic to have you, but we've got to let you go. We were absolutely thrilled to hear you on the mic in Paris, so we hope to keep hearing you in the future. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thanks so much, and I appreciate the kind words. Uh, fantastic insight. Fantastic beard, also. That's a, that's a beautiful beard win. Thank you, might we add. Uh, Nick, we've got two minutes left here. Uh, so we got to talk about your choice for MVP of the tournament. Yeah, so uh, we talked about him briefly when we were touching on Liquid. There was a lot of choices here, honestly. Mm. But I thought Miracle, Liquid Miracle had a really fantastic tournament. He stepped it up big time. And as uh, Tsunami kind of mentioned, Liquid was enabling him. Yeah. And he absolutely delivered. He had some fantastic games on Morphling. His Morphling was really, really, really threatening. Mm. And when a player or a carry player of the caliber of Miracles is putting up a performance on a carry like Morphling, it applies such tremendous pressure in the draft phase for the captains. Because now the opposing captain's like, oh man, can we deal with a Morphling that's being played this well? Mm. Do we have to ban it? Um, but also, he's just, he's just a, a very versatile weapon. He played on a fantastic game of TA. He played a couple great Monkey King games. Mm. Uh, his Jug is always a threat. Just a, a very, very great bounce back performance and he was the carry that Liquid uh, needed and deserved. I feel like um, he should have gotten more than, you know, the named MVP prize. He should also get, like, a tea party with Mickey and all of his friends since they're... Yeah, Puppy was named the finals MVP, but yeah. my, the MVP in my heart was, was Miracle. Right, no, of course. But, yeah. like, these people should get their own tea party. That's, that's like, content that we need. They got to, ri they got to ride roller need. coasters. Okay, whatever. It, it's not the same, mm. Nicholas, okay? We need to talk about money. Let's talk about money. The compendium is in, like, I don't even know how they're shattering these records, yeah. but they're doing it. We yeah. have to talk about this. Every, every single year, it seems like, I think, 
surely this is the one where it's just going to stay the same. But every single year, the compendium or the battle pass or whatever they're calling it now is completely ridiculous. Mm. This this year, it was the most amount of money in the first 24 hours in Dota 2 history. Mm. And I think we're 14 days ahead of schedule for where we were last year. So we're already at 50% of the prize pool from last year. And we're way ahead of schedule, two weeks ahead of schedule. So uh, the items are just ridiculous, the amount of money that people are putting into this. It's just defying all logic and expectation every single year. And I uh, I think that I was actually uh, talking to Tsunami before we... And uh, <laughs> he was uh, he was mentioning that he thinks that like China um, had that Chinese pride, right? China's in... Uh, the TIs in China this yeah, year, yeah. and they really want to get that prize pool as, as huge as possible so sure. that everybody knows that the Chinese TI was like the record setter. <laughs> but it comes from all over the world, True. obviously, all this money. So now I have to ask you, Nicholas, how much money have you poured into the compendium? But thankfully, none. I, I've actually. Nicholas! Yeah. I've what do you mean, thankfully, none? <laughs> I've been spending too much on magic cards. Wait. We need to have an intervention no, for Nicholas and no. his Magic Gathering no, I think addiction. We need, I think we need no. to have interventions for Dota people and their Battle Pass addictions. Okay, maybe just interventions It'll be a great big all. intervention for everybody. <laughs> okay, yeah, tomorrow on the show CS we're going to have an CS intervention. CSGO CS crates, people can come, up, come, come in, the Overwatch <laughs> loot boxes. Everybody can show up and we'll have a great big, like, you know, uh, value box anonymous sort of thing going on. Okay, so let me just get this right. Your addiction has hurt me in the following ways. Oh, Lord. That's how, that's how it all starts, okay? So get your list ready, everybody. We're going to give Nick an intervention and next time. We have him on the couch. All right, Nick, we better wrap this up because that was a whirlwind of Dota, of course. Tomorrow on Esports and 30, I'm sitting down with my boy Zurich for FPS Friday. And, of course, we've got that unmuted before that. Till then, thank you, Tsunami. Thank you, Nick. And thank you for watching. Make sure you hit us up on the socials just to say hi.